Okay. The attendees are still on hold. We are recording. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and click Start Broadcast. And at that point, um, we will be audible to everyone. OK. All right? Yep. I'm going to go ahead and start. And then um, right at 10, I will do the greeting for everyone. And okay. I'll, you'll hear when I'm passing over to you. All right, very good, thanks. Not a problem. Starting now. The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode.
Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. My name is Christina Lanham and I am a Lead Training of Solutions Associate with ITI. With me is our Marketing and Events Associate, Caitlin Lowry. For our regular attendees, you may realize that this is not the voice of your usual presenter. I am filling in for Zach Parnell as he was unable to be here today. This is our seventh webinar this year and we're excited that over 1,200 people have taken time out to join us for these events. Today's webinar is going to be on ASME, B30, and P30 developments, and I can't think of anyone better to talk on this subject than Mike Parnell. Just a reminder to you all, today we will be doing a quiz at the end of our session, and you could earn up to $50 to spend in the ITI bookstore. If you have not downloaded the quiz yet, I'm putting the link in the chat box now for you to download it. For our new attendees, I did want to take a moment and introduce you to ITI and what we're all about. For over 25 years, we've been conducting crane and rigging training for companies around the world. We are passionate about helping people build stronger skill sets in this field so they can create a safer work environment and go to home to their families each night. As reflected in our webinar today, companies from a variety of industries are involved in crane and rigging activities. Here you can see just a sampling of some of the companies that we have worked with over the years. Mike will be providing a lot of great information to you today, and if you miss something or cannot stay the whole time, remember you can download the presentation and watch this and previous webinars on our website at iti.com backslash showcase. As I mentioned earlier, I can't imagine anyone better to do today's webinar than Mike Purnell. He has been involved in ASME for a number of years and has a great amount of information that he can partake to everyone. So again, just a reminder, the link is in the chat box for you to download the quiz if you have not already. And I am going to pass the baton over to Mike and have him get started. Okay, well welcome everybody. We're very glad that you're here and uh, I'm going to make sure we get our screen up and uh, everybody see our uh, screen there. Uh, just uh, hi and welcome and we're really glad uh, that uh, you're able to spend a little time with us on this Friday. Uh, that we uh, have the privilege of uh, having 18 uh, different countries that have been uh, uh, registered for this uh, uh, corporations from those countries and 39 states and three provinces in Canada. So um, the uh, we're over 227 uh, folks uh, have registered for this uh, and and a lot of them have joined up to this point. So we're looking forward to a uh, rousing uh, walkthrough through for the ASME uh, B30 and some of the P30 items. So let's uh, move forward and as you know that you're able to uh, contact Christina with some questions that you have. I uh, would like to uh, start right off with, we have two questions that started in earlier uh, that were during the registrations. And I'm going to pull up one. Um, there was a question, uh, and this was by Dean Padgett out of Missouri by, uh, for pre-stress casting. And Dean's asking a question about uh, tie-offs or, um, or using uh, uh, during um, re-roping uh, projects for putting a new rope on machine. Uh, these are, uh, I just pulled these up this morning before we got started, but this, this particular series here, that's actually me working, somebody caught me working one time. Uh, this August, I was up in Ketchikan, Alaska. You can see it's pretty wet up there, but tie-off is required. Obviously, we're always looking for uh, 5,000 pounds uh, or more per, for a dead anchor for our lanyard to connect to or a hard sling to a lanyard uh, to a dead-end connection. And a qualified person needs to find that uh, or identify that, and it's very uh, much advised to uh, contact a crane manufacturer and identify that this is the target uh, point 
that we would like to tie off when we're accessing the crane in an elevated work uh, position and uh, the get the manufacturer's approval is really the um, best uh, step to take for and they may also uh, give advisement to uh, weld or attach uh, specific hard points uh, for connection but uh, it will be up to the manufacturer to give those specific instructions and obviously welding on a crane is really uh, uh, hazardous at best, so we'd want very specific information. They may have us bolt-on connections uh, for pad eyes or lugs that we can uh, connect to for our follow rest, but uh, don't do anything to a crane without checking with the manufacturer first and getting their approval in writing. Uh, we uh, quite often uh, in Woodland and, and other locations will use aerial work platforms for accessing and get tied off in those and using the proof system. So, uh, Dean, in answer to your question, uh, we're, we're looking for uh, a minimum uh, anchorage point. Uh, tying off is, is absolutely critical, and it is, it is a part of the, uh, if you'll notice in, in the new construction code, for those of you that have it, it's uh, 29 CFR 1926.1400. Uh, and it does address or talk about during inspections and other crane-related work to be uh, full rest and employee protection is required. So either we find those places, uh, you notice that I tied off over here on that on this uh, large 6x6 uh, six six tubing section. Uh, also, there are anchor points out on this uh, crane that we had to tie off to and then tied off into that uh, area work platform. So. Being secured is absolutely required, and uh, but check with the manufacturer if you're going to weld or bolt in, to a crane uh, component. So good question, Dean. I appreciate that very much. Let's take a look at another question we had, and um, let me pull this guy up. And the question uh, from uh, Morale Edhar uh, Nara Simhan, and uh, the question is uh, hook latches on all hooks and and so the um, just thinking about that and it is I'll, I'll just break it down the easiest way to kind of uh, reflect on this 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 particular section that you see highlighted in front of you here is from B30.10 ASME B30.10 and it talks about latches and if you'll notice it says when a latch is provided it shall be designed to retain such items and so on. And over in the removal criteria section, it says um, in, inoperative latch if required. So there's two areas there, and that should be a tip off to us that latches are not required in all cases. It depends on the country you're working in. And what I would suggest to you is that to think about it this way, is that the machines require latches. And so that would be cranes, hoists, both uh, electric and manual, uh, come-alongs, anything that actually moves, you think about this, it moves, the rigging moves the load, and those require latches. And you'll see that within each of the, each within the uh, ASME documents, um, that it, it, anytime we have a machinery uh, with gearing and, and or air system, et cetera, uh, helping hoist or move a load, latches are required on those in on those hooks. You won't see it as a general rule for an absolute requirement for slings. Uh, it's not required. H however, um, uh, yet I'll just say that uh, the, it, it's a, a recommendation, and we'd certainly uh, like to see those to help keep uh, the hook engaged. Uh, but it is not required for sling and uh, or the, for other uh, non-machine applications. So I hope that helps answer your question. And a great question. And then we have two more that have been asked, but I'm going to hold those to the end of our presentation. Uh, we have, uh, uh, I think we'll be able to cover a number of those items during the presentation that uh, Nate Dickinson and Mark Gay, uh, Mark's from Kiewit, Nate's from Crane Industry Services. I hope to address those before the end.
there is a quiz today uh, about this, and so it's going to have a little fun with it. There's some gift certificates, and we just thought we'd try it one time and see how it works. Our uh, primary content is about some of the ASME updates. Uh, as you'll know, that I'm uh, I'm not uh, a paid uh, representative, and I don't speak officially for ASME. I'm a volunteer, just like uh, most everyone else. And so you'll want to get your ASME documents in hand, take a look at those and make sure that you're familiar with them. And uh, if your company ad adheres to those, um, and a lot of folks do, uh, take, start designing your crane and rigging operations around meeting uh, many of the requirements that you'll find within the ASME docs. The equipment uh, covered within ASME, of course, continues to expand. I uh, will say, uh, I'll, and I'll comment on those as we go through, we will do really a volume uh, review for uh, all 30 volumes very quickly here. It starts out, of course, Jackson Rollers on point one, and it goes around. It w and this is just a, a laundry list, um, and it continues down. And we have some brand new ones here at the end we'll be discussing as well. So uh, let's uh, take a look and see uh, point one. So you'll, if you'll walk, as you follow with me in this uh, process, You'll notice that the uh, standard uh, volume is listed up in the upper left or top header, and then the uh, the name of the document is listed as well. I uh, was used to be the chairman for this uh, particular subcommittee, and it was just jacks at that time, mechanical and hydraulic. And uh, we have added um, industrial rollers, air casters, uh, air lifting bags, telescopic hydraulic gantry systems, and there is. Uh, uh, so we, we thought about just naming it Jackson Friends, but we went ahead and uh, uh, gave a laundry list of all of the uh, other uh, types of equipment there. Um, so we actually have chapters one and, and two now are mechanical and hydraulic jacks, three, four, five, and six, and we're actually adding uh, a new seven that's been approved by the main committee, and we will be uh, working on that and the due date on this is 2014, so there are a number of folks hard at work uh, to get strand jacks included, and it will fall within the jacks volume B30.1. So uh, it, it was published in 04 and then republished in 09, and I would suggest if you have any of that type of equipment, and a lot of folks that use uh, do perform machine removing, uh, jacking, industrial rollers, synthetic rollers, uh, Hillman and multi-ton type rollers, all of those, uh, if you have that equipment in-house in, in, in hand, certainly something to get your hands on and start taking a look. It's got an excellent uh, rigging and operating practices section in it besides all the inspections and all, but it talks about blocking, uh, out of levelness, all the things that have to do with supporting and uh, supplementing the activities related to it. So I would strongly uh, suggest that you get involved with, uh, get that volume purchased and get it in-house. The next one's point two, and we're just going to spend a few minutes uh, and sometimes very short order to discuss some of the uh, items as they come forward. Point two, of course, is uh, overhead cranes and gantries. It's sort of the, was in the initial, as the ASME documents go, go back many years and were at one time under ANSI over uh, direct uh, control, they have farmed them out to the ASME group. And uh, we still report to ANSI, but this is certainly, if you can just look at the, at the number of the document, in this case, point two, it's an old document, and it's been around a long time, but there's a lot of new updates to it, new things that, were, that are happening that we want to be cognizant of. The next revision is 2015, and what they're working on right now, minimum breaking force, uh, we used to have a term throughout all of these standards called uh, minimum breaking strength. And adopting some of the uh, ISO and some of the European uh, verbiage, the Wire Rope Technical Board, WRTV, uh, has pr provided a new uh, definition. And you'll see this minimum brake force. Uh, it is replacing the uh, minimum brake strength. And that will be in uh, almost all hoisting uh, volumes. And that will be in the new standard B30.30, which is at the very end of the presentation here. And it talks about uh, the catalog uh, braking strength but it is a better definition that identifies the rope uh, can, uh, classification and breaking strength. Uh, there are new, uh, new labeling requirements that are being imposed. Uh, we, how many times have we got onto a uh, pendant control 
and you see the buttons there and they're all wore off and you can't identify uh, which button does what and or which direction. So we've recognized some problems in the industry and so we're look, working hard to fix that. Uh, maintenance uh, program to be implemented in Chapter 4, which is really good. And then a uh, training requirement that, uh, and I think what you'll end up finding is that folks that, and this will be uh, kind of across the board with different kinds of equipment. So training re requirements for the actual operator, uh, for a an operator in training, and for maintenance slash repair folks. So there are training requirements for all three. So maintenance mechanics that have to work on cranes have to be marginally or provisionally uh, trained in how to operate the crane in order to accomplish their work. So uh, operating uh, training requirements will cover a whole group of folks as we go forward, management responsibilities. And I believe that they'll also be entertaining or involving the lift director, site supervisor. All those elements will also be rolled into point two. Um, this is a, uh, by the way, we put in a, uh, 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 an offering that we would uh, also provide to you some uh, requests for interpretation that have been provided recently to the main committee. I sit there, I'm the vice chair for the main committee. And so I offered to bring out uh, some of the requests that different folks in our industry have uh, uh, sent to B30 and to have entertained. So here's one question. And these are all, uh, well, they're posted typically in the back of a volume, but I, I, we've uh, ferreted them out and brought them to you. It says, on for an overhead crane, do the load test requirements uh, in section uh, 22222 uh, address the load test of the underlying support structure. So if you might think about uh, a crane that runs, of course, on a bridge, and uh, the trolley system is there, and the um, hoist hook and block and so on. So the idea is that the, um, do the, does the load test, sort of the question is, does the load test, does it also uh, provide a, some verification or load test uh, certification for the underlying support structure, which would be the columns and uh, runways. So that's really the core of the question. And I'll give you the answer here is no. It only provides uh, a test for the actual crane itself. And it does not uh, suppl supply uh, any verification of the runway system because it's only about the machine. You know, think about that. It's we're only able to. You can buy a machine like this, bring it in on a truck, and put it up on any kind of support structure. And so the test really is only. It's only about the crane, uh, and and it's not about what it's sitting on. So you should have. We should always make sure that we have um, the uh, runway support system uh, well engineered, uh, and the columns should be. Uh, engineered as well as the foundation that the columns are resting on. So that's an all different um, area of, uh, of attention that needs to be paid by a separate entity and that can be contracted by the site or location. But ASME uh, can't reach past the machine in what it's trying to help the users understand and perform. So, it, so the supporting structure is not included as a verification pro, uh, element in the load test. Excellent question. Here's another one for uh, overhead cranes. Can the load test be conducted using test weights equal to 100% of the crane of the rate of capacity? And the answer, of course, that to that one, the, the uh, 40 plus members of the main committee said yes. Uh, if you had a um, test weights that were verifiable and you had a 10 ton crane, you wanted to put 20,000 pounds of weights underneath it to perform 100% uh, lift, uh, test lift, that would be fine. Uh, that would be in place of actually a dynamometer or crane scale because if they're certified weights, they perform the same service and they've already been certified. Here's another question, uh, request for interpretation. If the load uh, test weights are 100% of the rate capacity, can their load rating be certified, and that's kind of a troubling question to ASME, be certified at 100% of the test weights rate of capacity? And the answer to that is ASME, and this, so this is just a, re, a response to interpretation, ASME does not certify an activity, however the load rating can be verified at 100% of the rate of capacity. So what can be created is a document that uh, verifies that the test weights 
was used uh, the load the test date the signature of the tester and the um, and the document that explains the entire testing activity it does not uh, th this weight and the process uh, it w it's it would not be okay to say it was a certified ASME test that's really not it that's not accurate at all it is a test performed by the owner of the crane and uh, at, at their uh, arm's length, potentially with a third party or someone in-house. But it's simply been that the uh, crane's been verified. That's the key, key word right there, been verified, and, um, and to, to meet the code re uh, requirements. In many cases, it's a should and uh, not, not uh, cases of a shall, but it is a should uh, that it's a good idea to do upon an original installation or major repair. So. Let's go on to uh, B30.3 for tower crane. And this really is, saying it without saying it, is uh, it's really about construction tower cranes. It's not about shipyards and other permanent installations that's handled in a different volume. So this is really about the construction type tower crane that's erected on site. The next revision is 2012 and responsibilities under that section, which will detail uh, lift director site supervisor crane owner, crane operator, and crane user. And as you know, we're moving forward with our, our heavy use of the term and phrase lift director and lots of other folks in all the other volumes. And that's building up to the P30 document for lift planning. Uh, so we'll see that uh, heavily uh, incorporated into this document. And then the signal system will be upgraded. Uh, communication, secure communication, hardwired communication, and so on. We'll see a number of uh, really good revisions coming out of point three. Uh, Peter Duran is the uh, the chair for that. Um, he is an outstanding uh, chair and leader for that and has assembled a great team to work with him. We've got all the names of the folks. If you have any questions about uh, who are the chairs for some of these that you want to email me, uh, do so and I'll try to get you in touch with them if you have a per particular question on a particular volume. So let's see, uh, oh, this was a little tower crane subcommittee to develop new signal communication systems. So this is a little, uh, just a little chuckle joke. Here we have a few of these drop in. I noticed our, our staff has put in some of these and it's just uh, break up our, uh, my uh, monotonous presentation. So uh, B30.4 is portal and pedestal crane. And this is a, a long-term uh, committee. Uh, their next uh, upgrade is a current current volume that you should have in your library is 2010. Next one will be 2015. You'll notice again we have uh, all the responsibilities as we discussed with lift, lift director. Preventive maintenance program is also planned to be included in this new volume. And then of course tower cranes were removed uh, from this and uh, the uh, defined uh, they they created additional uh, definitions for boom stop and some of the criteria about buffer and bumper based on the rolling gantry being able to impact at a certain force, uh, speed, and weight of the machine, and so on, and then expanded the operator qualifications. Uh, B30.5, one of the biggest uh, 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 volumes that we ha have as far as attention in our organization, mobile cranes and locomotive cranes, of course. You'll notice that the old, um, uh, the old, B30.15 uh, addressed some mobile cranes, and they were uh, that volume was discontinued and then wrapped into point five. So you'll notice 15 is actually missing from our list, uh, and it's been absorbed into uh, point five a number of years ago. Operator training is required by ASME, and that that is uh, for operators, operators in training and maintenance personnel. That will all be coming up in the future. And um, if some of those elements are certainly already covered, uh, but you'll notice that uh, ASME doesn't um, require certification. Uh, certification is required by OSHA. So, so realize and understand the difference that really ASME is all about the training or use of the equipment, and OSHA has now certainly got involved in a big way in certification of operators. That's coming up in 2014, and that certification will come about. And lots and lots of folks already have been certified since uh, starting in 1995 in a voluntary process. And of course, in uh, 20, 
10, we had a new 1926.1400 construction crane document that said from today forward to 2014, you need to be either qualified, training qualified, or certified, but November of 2014 is a drop dead date for having certification. So, and that's for construction crane operators. A lot of our, we've had numerous discussions in other webinars about uh, whether general industry folks uh, may fall into that. And if you do construction related work, then those operators will need to be uh, certified. But if it's strictly general industry where you're doing planned repairs and maintenance as required by the manufacturer of the machinery you're working on, such as a gearbox and motor, then that may stay in the general industry category and not require operator certification. Let's take a look. Uh, the next revision is 2016. They have a brand new one, actually. So if you check your library, double check and see if you have a 2011 uh, revision. They have added some definitions for critical lift and minimum breaking force. There's our wire rope term. Again, that replaces breaking strength. Uh, new requiring for labels and controls. Uh, shift sizes have been clarified and uh, phrased as load, load rating chart replaces load capacity chart. There's a number of new elements in there, and the, I know that that is a very hardworking committee. I see them working almost always two days before every main committee, presenting their findings at the main committee, and then they just work on a year-round basis to help provide upgrades and interpretations for that subcommittee. Um, Chris uh, Ryan is the uh, chairman for that. Chris lives in Louisiana. We hope Chris survived the Hurricane Isaac that went through there recently, and uh, Chris works with Bow Brothers. He's an outstanding uh, chair and has provided a lot of leadership for that group for a long time, and he has, is surrounded by some very talented individuals that work with him. So if you have some questions about that, you need to get with me, and I can uh, potentially get you in, in touch with Chris Ryan. So let's uh, keep moving along here. Additional uh, to uh, MB30.5, here's a request for interpretation that was sent in. Is a crane owner required to provide a qualified rigor uh, for lifting operations, and that was uh, sent to the B30.5 subcommittee. So is the owner required? When the owner delivers a crane to a site, is he required to provide a qualified rigger for lifting operations? And the .5 committee said no. Obviously, that would be uh, quite a bit on the shoulders of the site owner or by contract who's providing personnel, and it could be a crane. the crane owner may be providing a potentially a crane operator with that machine. But the riggers, the signal person, uh, laborers, all those other things may come under uh, different headings and different corporations, subcontractors, et cetera. But it would not be the obligation of the owner to provide the riggers. So that's a great, great answer there by that subcommittee. Uh, another one is a uh, request for interpretation. Is the uh, crane owner allowed to accept the load weight uh, information provided to him by the site? So when you go into the B30 point, five um, volume, you'll notice that out of those five uh, folks that are listed there, the uh, lift director, site supervisor, operator, owner, and user, the uh, lift director and site supervisor in effect are to provide, uh, by one way or the other, provide the uh, operator with the load weight. And once that's done, the question is, is the operator allowed to simply accept that weight provided to them by the site. And so that's really the question. Uh, and the answer is yes, because that's part of the process. And those are the assignments of those two individuals, lift director and site supervisor, but lift director to provide that weight to the operator. And so it is, it is, once it's been provided, you have a responsible party that's given you some information on which you're about to make the lift. And that is the decision tree and the workflow plan that we are trying to help encourage in the U.S. and get things uh, moving. So. Here's another question, uh, and by the way, all of the questions, when an interpretation comes out, uh, it, what happens is it's sent to the uh, B30 uh, secretary, and uh, the uh, secretary ends up uh, sending it to the, it, it's sent to the uh, B30 chair of that volume, in this case, Chris Ryan at B30.5, and uh, the subcommittee provides the response. They, in turn, send it to the main committee for approval because it's under the main committee's uh, signature that all responses are released. 
So the main committee then will send it back to the, uh, sub, the B30 secretary for publication. So it, uh, the, the response by the subcommittee right here is the recommendation to the main committee. The main committee actually has to review it. There's over 40 folks that do that, and they in turn uh, get it published and sent out. So, so when I say the subcommittee is responding, it's typically they're providing an initial response and the main committee has to provide an agreement to that. And in some cases there may be a little wording or it may, it may be a, not a satisfactory response and the main committee will push it back to the subcommittee. So, so let's take a look at this question. Is the crane operator uh, not responsible for improper rigging that is out of his view? You'll notice this is a complete, you know, it's really a negative question, meaning negative the word not is here, improper, and out of his view. So it's rather a tricky question. You kind of have to deal with it in that phrase. So is the, is the operator not responsible uh, for improper rigging? And another way to say that would be, is the, is the crane operator um, responsible for proper rigging out of his view? I mean, there's a, there's a lot of ways to kind of dice this up. So I want you to see that by the tone and, and uh, method in which the question was submitted, that we on the main committee had to answer that. So the answer is, uh, yes, the crane operator is not responsible for hazards or conditions not under his direct control. So here's the idea. Is, uh, it could be a blind pick or something happening on the other side of a wall the operator can't see. And is he responsible for either bad rigging or poor rigging methods that are out of his view? And He's not responsible, so really the answer is he's not responsible for hazardous conditions not under his direct control. If you'll remember years ago, the operator was sort of responsible anytime you picked a load up for anything from gate to gate, fence to fence, all over the property. And we've been able to slim that down to, let's make the operator only responsible for the things that really associated directly with the crane, the load chart, the reeving, all the things pertinent to the crane and not anything beyond that. And there are other people and personnel that we've now started to identify more specifically and more pointedly uh, to help handle the things that are past the crane hook that he really can't be uh, have. It could be a tire crane where he's sitting 300 feet above and uh, through the fog he can't see anything. So, you, you know, you have to take a look at what can he actually manage or control. Well, he can control whether uh, the amount of weight that he's going to pick up He's got to verify that and then confirm his crane capacity and crane setup and all those other things. But things are out of his control. They're off the table. They're off the list. Let's take a look at B30.6 for Derek's. This isn't a very fast-moving uh, subcommittee, only, well, there's proposed new equipment, so onboard restrooms. Thank you for that. So let me go back. and, uh, But it is a... Uh, this will have a new uh, publication coming out very soon, and uh, but uh, the, the things don't change very often for this industry, for this group, and uh, so they're, they're in the next revision will be in about three years. Under B30.7 for winches, uh, let's take a look there. You'll remember that this uh, was called at one time uh, base-mounted drum hoists, and uh, base mounted drum hoist, and it was really all about vertical lifting. Well, we've been able to uh, reorganize that so it can be used for horizontal work and vertical work. So you'll notice another, uh, uh, this is sort of the entry point. This is kind of cool because we're able to introduce some new language here, load handling activity, which was sort of birthed under B30.7, and that meant uh, either uh, moving the load uh, vertical or horizontal or some other uh, position other than that, up an, up an incline. So once we were able to start load handling activity, so it just didn't mean lifting, then we were able to uh, absorb that or get that over into um, jacks because jacks can be used to push a load sideways, uh, rollers, of course, and we're going to start to see that potentially, potentially with slings and other equipment that it's not always just about lifting. We have to overcome friction and overcome the load weight and friction to get something to move horizontally. So uh, this has been re-termed winches so that it's not just restricted to this uh, base-mounted drum hoist. And it has gone through a new rewrite. It's a really good document for anybody using winches, boilermakers, pipe fitters, and other folks. 
it's got a brand new volume, uh, 2011. Get your hands on it. It's a really good, uh, nice upright uh, up, upgrade, and we'll start to see some of those responsibilities be floated into some of the next revisions. So let's take a look then. Um, oh, efforts being made to change the uh, winch volume to a more friendly user standard. Um, it's being greatly resisted. So we have a comedy group that's been able to, to filter some pictures in here with us. B30.8 is floating cranes and derricks. This has gone through a number of uh, new generational steps. Look for new definitions for uh, liquid free surface and load lines. This is really good. Uh, we've had a number of barge failures with cranes on them and or loads placed on them. So we're getting much stronger language that requires uh, uh, structural competence by a qualified person. And typically, that's going to get down to a very specific call out when you really look at the definition. Who really a marine surveyor, mar uh, marine architect, uh, qualified engineer for those types of structures. That qualified person definition is going to carry a lot of weight when we're really trying to decide the use of a crane and barge operation in combination. Uh, new watertight integrity requirements, and we, they've added offshore barge requirements as well. This is a fairly new document, 2010. The next revision is 2015. So take a look at that if you have uh, your operations involve floating cranes or floating derricks. Uh, great, great volume to take a look at. Oh, it's a new method for drying clothes of employees who have fallen overboard. So thank you for that drop in. All right, let's take a look at slings. I'm the chairman for slings, and sometimes it's uh, as in all of life, you don't know whether you're chasing or leading, but we're moving forward with a lot of changes uh, coming up. And in the last revision in 2010, uh, we have some new definitions, uh, rated loads based on symmetrical loading. If it's non-symmetrical load, then a qualified person needs to get more involved in determining tensions per leg. Uh, we have we just made a clarification. I'll tell you, we got a, there was an interesting article here written by uh, an individual in our industry, and uh, talking about how many uh, hitches do we need to have on uh, a sling tag, and you know, the, sort of the universe just keeps going and going and going, and really all the B uh, clear back to 1994 that we could track 1996 for ASME to current date. And, all, and OSHA to current date, uh, all, all we've been able to identify and all we want, wanted to identify is a single uh, hitch type and angle upon which it's based. If you want to add more, that's fine. But training and, and information, the tags are only so big, they're only going to provide so much information. And uh, if you think about chain slings, chain slings typically have one rating. It may be on a single leg. It could be on a two leg uh, with the master link up here, but two legs at 60 degrees. But they don't have uh, then. It, so if you take that uh, that sling and choke with it, then you have to have another rating. And there's just only so much room on the tag to put in so much information. So that's why training is such an important part and knowledge by that person, because we know that typically for chain slings, we've got to reduce that capacity. Uh, by 20% when we choke or hitch. So that's going to take information, and that's where qualified riggers come in. Uh, that's where we start to apply the known rating, and then we make the adjustments based on our load application. So uh, I will uh, reiterate, there's only, you only have to have one rating, uh, one hitch type, and rated load for an angle. You can have 16 on there if you want, but you really only have to have one as a starting point, and then a qualified rigger in the field should be able to identify what that rating is adjusted to based on his application. Obviously, D to D ratio is a huge issue for wire rope slings and other round type slings. Uh, I say round slings like synthetic rope slings. Um, and D to D ratio, there's a new publication uh, been in integrated that there will be a new D to D uh, insertion for chain actually now. So. Uh, could you put D to D ratio limitations on a, on a sling tag? You know, so the, so the sling identification can only carry so much info, and so we're limiting to that, and training and information and education has really got to help pick up the balance of it. Uh, we have load ratings uh, based on uh, hand splice slings and mechanical splice slings uh, based on the minimum D to D ratios. Uh, there is a, um, I got a great question in the other day from a client. Uh, the the periodic, the annual recorded, is only required through ASME, 
for uh, chain slings and metal mesh slings. And they all, uh, they are required, in effect, they have serial numbers with them. So we have to have an individual record uh, for those two types of slings. So those are uh, uh, an individual record, annual periodic inspection for chain and metal mesh. All others only require that, that we document that the inspection was done. And so there's no individual um, record required for wire rope slings, synthetic web slings, uh, synthetic round slings, or synthetic uh, rope slings. It's just a single document. could be a time card for employee. Uh, could be a single entry document that goes into uh, your, your files that on this date we did all the, all the uh, synthetic sling inspections in Building 5, and we inspected 86 of them and rejected um, 12 of them, and the 12 need to be replaced and so on. So the, there is no, uh, we only need to document, did we do it, that's what's required, but there's not an individual record required for these four types of slings, only, only the fact that it was done. And we, we, these do not get individually serial numbered as a general rule, nor are they required, so there would be no way to track it to identify all those inspection uh, documents. So only, only chain slings and metal mesh are required to have that individual record of inspection. Uh, broken wire criteria was added for cable laid slings. And uh, we have some new definitions in terms, new, new things happening in the synthetic rope industry and uh, some new high, high strength uh, uh, HMPE type ropes and we have pin diameters, recommendations for uh, sling applications by WSTDA. So get your hands on the new uh, 2010 volume, and we have another one that we're really working hard at to get out by 2013. And we're meeting in about three weeks in St. Louis to continue to track more uh, progress on that. Sling subcommittee has been requested to develop a rated capacity table for dog slings and uh, uh, by breed and bite. So th thanks for our, uh, our comedy department for dropping that in for us. All right, let's take a look at hooks. And latest one's 2009. And we're going to continue to burn through this. Uh, you'll notice that the old OSHA requirements uh, may still be in effect of 15% uh, uh, spread and uh, 10 degrees twist. And what you're going to find, though, over time here is the ASME document is completely changed to uh, it is uh, zero, zero twist and 5% spread not to exceed uh, quarter inch. And that's the new, and this is really by consensus. The manufacturers, the users, all the folks, that, all the players got together and really came up with this new um, value and measurement, which has basically got to be done by calipers or some sophisticated measuring device. So that's a change. And, and the manufacturers of those parts, could, it would be hooks for come-alongs, chain falls, crane hooks, sling hooks, every hook under the sun, uh, the manufacturers have basically got together for the new ones that are being produced. And if you call one today, that will be the value that they're going to insist on is the 5% spread not to exceed quarter inch and zero degrees twist, even though it's, it may be still printed in OSHA, um, they can go tighter or more restrictive, but not more liberal. So uh, this is really the rules in the, in, in the playground that we're all going to be playing by. And this has been in effect uh, certainly uh, since 09 and before uh, in practice. So let's be using that as our practice. A hook subcommittee asked about heat damage. Notice one of my clients uh, sent this. One of our folks sent, uh, dropped this in. This is a spreader bar over in a steel mill. And with a little bit of inattention on the operator's part, here's one hook. And here's another hook that actually went into the uh, steel, uh, molten steel, and uh, was just a little lackadaisical. So it can happen to everybody. But uh, he, I think, is uh, going through a retraining program. On B30.11, for, um, and you'll notice that this one is going to be, uh, there's an approval right now uh, by the main committee. It's going to get ANSI approval eventually with public review, but there will, 
the proposal is that B30.11 and B30.17 will be combined into one document. Uh, there's a lot of crossover of equipment and interrelation between those two, so this is something that's coming in the future. And I know that uh, two subcommittees have formed into a single committee, and they will be, uh, they are putting their efforts in right now to create that into a, and it's called 11 team uh, in its temporary format, but um, we do have a 2010 version of point 11 out for monorails and underhung hoist, and uh, the uh, markings are uh, a new item in there, all sections affected. Take a look at uh, uh, preventive maintenance, uh, training, uh, other elements have been upgraded in that, and that, those will all be rolled forward. I'm not sure they're going to beat the 2015 date before they can get this combined document together. If not, they'll have to republish and go to the following revision date. But they're working hard right now to make those upgrades. Um, ASME ad hoc committee to help uh, rewrite a new definition of overload. One of our folks found this, and I thought that was pretty fun to put in. It would be a long day for the truck driver. My goodness. Take a look at uh, B30.12 uh, Rotorcraft. And uh, Ted uh, Blanton is uh, chair for this subcommittee and doing a great job with it, and the, as well as the folks working with them. Just recently, in 2011, they've added long lines which kind of look like slings, but they're not slings, but they're, they're long lines in the rotorcraft and the helicopter industry, and these could be 50 to 150, 200 feet long. They hang out from underneath the winch, and they have a dedicated uh, position. You'll often see these in the firefighting helicopters that, that hang um, uh, water, uh, bowl or water baskets that help put fires out. So they call them long lines, and they have their own criteria for use. Uh, expanded maintenance requirements for primary hook. This uh, organ, this particular volume is uh, extremely subject to the FAA rules and some of the requirements there, and those get integrated into the volume. And it adds a spooling requirement and its ability to make sure it doesn't rat's nest on the drum, causing shock load, shock release, and some other bad things. So they have a new revision date coming up in 2017. All right, let's take a look. Oh, Rotorcraft to provide interpretation of hairspray on blades. That was very, that's cute. And let's take a look. Oh, Rotorcraft to implement static charge avoidance requirements. There. Okay, good. Excellent. Thank you for that. And let's keep going. 2013. This is a very uh, small part of our market that deals with storage retrieval machines. A lot of these are automated. Uh, they work off computer systems, and uh, and there uh, you won't see them in very many workplaces. I know Boeing and some other folks have them and they are to uh, retrieve parts, components that are in storage locations, bring them to a central point, and the employees then use those parts. But the new upgrade is 2011. It does have requirement, uh, added requirements. You can put riders on the carriage to help uh, pick stock and place into a carriage uh, or tray, uh, safety uh, PPE, and then braking requirements and bumpers. They've added those uh, free fall stops on carriages. That's a really good thing inspections assigned by designated person, and they have a new revision coming up in 2017. I'd say they're probably a quarter of a quarter of a quarter of 1% of our marketplace for uh, machines used, but where they're used, um, they can hurt people, and uh, they are really do deserve some attention. So, uh, Storage retrieval is a one-man subcommittee, often gets, uh, requires rest between five-year revisions. That's not quite true. I know there's four or five folks on there, and they do work hard to keep that up to date. Uh, B30.14, and uh, on side boom tractors, pipe layers, really a great job, Doug Smith, um, Chicago Bridge and Iron is the chair for this one, and Doug and his group has done a great job in 2010 to rewrite. Uh, it's completely updated, completely different than the older version of the side boom tractors. If you don't have that version revision and you are using those or working around those, doing pipe laying, associated work, please get your hands on it. Next revision is 2015. A lot of changes for design construction, and they are giving um, the uh, operational aids um, provisions in there. You'll notice the LMI incorporated, and uh, for load indicators, boom angle indicators, and so on, and what to do if they're inoper inoperational. Uh, so it's really a very good advancement. It's keeping up with the electronics out there available in the marketplace to help these machines be safer and, and to be operated within the accepted range. 
Uh, all new operators required to have special haircuts. Okay, thanks, Doug, for that. And 2016 is uh, overhead hoists, and these are can be manual, electric, etc. Not many changes were in 07, but they are they have been voting considerably, um, and uh, in small changes. But the next revision will be 2012. But I expect to see in uh, would be five years from then 2017 will be a much larger over overhaul of that document and it's getting special attention Ernie Marburg and uh, Jim Danielson are working hard to help get that upgraded and so we'll see a lot of new changes in that over the next few years let's take a look then at uh, oh host committees are worried about future if gravity is not present at work sites okay oh Jim and Ernie appreciate that B30.17 this is the one that was going to be combined with 0.11 and uh, and so we have some similar tracking. The thing is, you have to continue to publish it until you get this merger done. So there were small changes in 06, and uh, actually this next revision is 12, and that's going to be out very soon. And uh, what will happen is uh, they'll have to continue to publish it until they get that merger revision done, but we should see some changes there and coming very quickly. Uh, let's see. Uh, Point seventeen subcommittee takes a break in the uh, soccer uh, game. The chairman gets one right in the face. So thank you for that. Point eighteen is stacker cranes, and it's a little bit like the retrieval cranes. Let's go back and see. Not many changes to this one. Established minimum uh, bumper and buffer uh, uh, considerations. Tenant control marking, a PM program, and record keeping. Next one is twenty fourteen, and this one is very much like the uh, retrieval machines. And uh, not a lot of uh, those in the U.S., but where they are, the people do get hurt. Um, remember, press up to go up, press down to go down. There you go. All right, saying for the day, 20, uh, point 19, I serve on this one as well. Have a lot of fun with these guys. Uh, Bob Wild with the Corps of Engineers is currently the uh, chair for this. And uh, Bob does a great job keeping us all in line. And I kind of have a wire rope background, so the, this is a really fun uh, committee for me. And uh, we do uh, have upgraded this. It went through a number of enhancements. We talked about inspections by qualified person and establishing a PM program, frequent inspection requirements, and to uh, include rotational resistant rope. Uh, and uh, talks about synthetic shivs um, because those can be used and, and are used in some cases, lockout tagout program, and uh, 2016 is the next revision. So a number of things will be coming forward. These are used in to span riverways um, and canyons to help get equipment into place. Uh, some brand new ones have been put up in the last five to eight years to help with big construction projects. So they're still out there and there's a lot of standing ones there. U.S. Ge uh, Geological Survey, they have 400 of them within a five state area that span rivers to test water and so on. So. Cableways are really around. You just don't see many of them, uh, but they're really a lot of them in place and in use. Uh, cableways to rule on request for cliffside installation. Well, there you go. That looks like an Oregon picture of some type. So, all right, 20. Oh, this is nice. Uh, below the hook lifting devices, and I have some new news for this one. And um, don't forget, we'll have a little quiz after this is all over. So we'll keep up here. Point 20 is below the hook lifting devices. You all know that. Um, the design of lifting devices is in a separate set of part document. It's called ASMEBTH-1. So when you go to uh, our bookstore or the ASME.org bookstore, ASMEBTH-1 is for the engineers to design these devices by, and it's been extracted from point 20. So that design information was taken out of point 20, and this document now really is really targeted for the users, for us that operate it, inspect it, handle it, and all that. So that this document is really user-oriented, and BTH-1 is the design document. So if you're looking for that design criteria, go to the BTH-1 design document. And those are very hardworking guys, and boy, they, they put in a lot of time. Uh, Dave Dewar, I think, out of Houston is the new chair, maybe for BTH-1, and Phil Boyd is the chair from Boeing for the uh, B30.20, uh, B and they do a marvelous work with all the folks that work with them. 
The BT, uh, below the hook lifting device B30.20 language is changed concerning alterations and modifications. Refers to rigging attachment and component. So if a spreader bar is in place and you have sort of permanently connected uh, chain leg drops and all what do you inspect them to? So think about that for a minute. Um, I think we have a question on this. If I take a look here. No, we don't. But let's think about that for a second. That uh, if I've got chain slings hanging on a, a, doc, a, a bar like this, I would be inspecting the B30.20 using that document to inspect the, the lifting beam and B30.9 to inspect the chain couplers, chain legs, and the hooks from because we have prescriptive information about those devices that hang off of there. So we are, uh, the construction and inspection requirements, we are pushed to take a look at those applicable volumes when we have additional items that basically I'm going to call them permanently attached, not when they're just hanging in a hook and you can remove them by hand, but those that are actually dedicated to it and uh, to be used specifically for that device. Let's take a look and keep going here. 21 is manually operated lever hoist come alongs. These are uh, roller chain and uh, chain type. And there is a web type as well. And so there are a number of different types that are used. And uh, 2010 is being, uh, was reaffirmed. Uh, Jim Danielson is the, um, the new chair for that. And Jim is helping out. Get the get the organ, organizing the subcommittee to come up with a very strong 2015 upgrade and revision, and it will be uh, addressing a preventive maintenance, training, minimum breaking force, et cetera, and other global requirements, which would include inspection items. So that committee is really in a in a drive forward mode, and they're really working hard to get that upgraded. So Jim's doing a great job. New definition for a come along. Everybody see that? There you go. Don't see that every day. All right. So let's take a look here, and we have. Um, you go back one page, and on B30.22, articulating booms, these are obviously taken uh, our marketplace by storm, and a lot of these are showing up at job sites. Uh, Dan Wolf uh, did a marvelous job with his committee uh, with getting all of the uh, upgrades to 2010. It's really a very well done document. If you have articulating boom cranes in your fleet or use them on your job site, I would definitely get my hands on this document. It de details really well um, load ratings, uh, load charts for more information for operating positions, rope classifications, uh, wireless controls are now add, have been added to that, operational aids like LMI, load moment indicators, and so on, qualified person, uh, maintenance programs and so on. So next one will be uh, upgraded or uh, enhanced in 2015. And um, the actually the uh, uh, Mark uh, Jacks timer is the uh, new chair for that from the Navy Crane Center, and he's helping out in a great way with a lot of folks that are uh, hanging right with him to make this a new and improved document as it goes forward. So um, we see if you have some of those please make sure that you get this document. Here's an, our request for interpretation on articulating, we call them knuckle booms. Does the uh, load test requirements qualify the supporting structure, which is maybe the truck, as well as the crane itself? And so that was sent in. And what do you think the main committee, how do you think they responded to that request? So let's take a look. And the answer is no. Uh, the load test. Uh, does not qualify the truck. It could be anybody's truck. You put that knuckle boom on onto a truck. There are certain provisions that we should be really following, but the load test, what it's supposed to do is confirm the crane's operational performance and the truck's stability with a specified load. That's about as good as it gets, and that's about all we can do. But it's uh, but the ASME uh, V30 can't reach into if it's a GM truck or a Ford or a Dodge or a um, an IH or whatever kind of truck it is, we can't reach into that part of the world. It's, it's sort of like the supporting structure on an overhead crane, columns and runways. We don't really, we can't really speak to what kind of machinery that that this boom is sitting on. So that's really up to the owner builder 
uh, manufacturer to make those determinations, and the load test is only really checking can the crane do what it's supposed to operationally perform, and for goodness sakes, let's find out if the crane if the truck tips over. You know, that's really the, about the best you can hope for out of that kind of load test. All right, uh, personal lifting platforms or systems, man baskets, B30.23. And uh, we have, uh, let's take a look here. Oh, there's, here's the, uh, in 2010, uh, expanded uh, information about gates, uh, access barriers, and more information about the hoisting equipment, qualified person to take a look and inspect a PM program is there a prohibition for hoisting equipment operators, uh, where, when are those pro prohibitions uh, delineated, and incorporating a lift director and site supervisor into their verbiage as well. And the next one's coming out in 2015. I know we've been voting furiously on some of the new upgrades to the uh, B30.23, and you'll, we'll see some new things as it rolls forward. And one of our staff put in personnel lifting system rigging method for a new carrier. Thank you for that. Okay, 24. And uh, container cranes, and we have, uh, it's all new volume. If you have container cranes, it was new in 08, and next revision is 2013. Uh, my good friend Jim Richardson is the uh, chair for that, and he's got a good fleet and uh, folks that work with him on that. Uh, this is a brand new document, really was in the wings for B30 for years, and just went nowhere, and uh, Jim and company uh, Bill Rumberg and a number of other folks stepped up and they really got uh, poured the coals to it and got some good headway on it. So if you don't have a new container crane volume, pick it up now. It's going to be quite a while before we get to the next one. Container crane subcommittee issues new requirements for notices. Okay, there you go. Thank you for that. Notice the notices. And let's take a look at scrap handlers. You know, kind of funny. How did these things end up in B30? And they are material handling. And uh, we have uh, a, no, a number of good folks. Something that came to light was that uh, the, not all these things had seat belts or doors or door protectors, and, and we were having people fall out of the unit. Uh, they buck around a lot because the uh, uh, nature of the work and scrap handling and tossing uh, material and so on, and, and we were um, unfortunately having issues, and so we had to write a new, uh, ba basically a PPE requirement and uh, to help keep everybody in. But they are uh, built by a number of good manufacturers, but we had to make sure that we had uh, ways to also help with provisions for uh, helping the employees downstream uh, from previous. Uh, let's see. So let me get my uh, document here, and I got take a look at on our next frame. Thank you for your patience. Oh, scrap and material handlers get better teeth. Thanks for that. All right. And let's get, uh, oh, there's one of mine that I get to sit on and work. Uh, Charles Lucas is uh, the chair for this. I'm a committee member uh, with Charles. Uh, and uh, Charles does a great job on rigging hardware. As you all know, uh, that includes, um, well, let's get back to the real stuff. That includes uh, chapter one is shackles. Uh, chapter two, we have adjustable devices. Uh, like uh, threaded devices like eye bolts, uh, swivel hoist rings, and so on. Uh, three, we have links, rings, and swivels. Uh, chapter four, we have, a, have um, compression fittings like wedge sockets and, and cable clamps. And uh, five, we have a new uh, LIDs, load indicating devices like dynamometers. And uh, actually, uh, and, and cautions to personnel, and we actually have a new item that uh, is up for consideration, and we're thinking about uh, beam clamps and plate clamps to be uh, moved. They're currently sitting in uh, B30.20 as below the hook lifting devices. And so sort of the questions, move those from B30.20 into B30.26. And so, uh, and uh, it's, we think that's the way it's going. They certainly are prevalent in the marketplace and could deserve their own chapter within this rigging hardware uh, section and probably be well served because it would get a lot more detail than the inspection and usage instructions related to those two devices. So 
Uh, we'll know in the next few years if that's able to go forward and see how that is able to um, be accomplished. Uh, nothing's carved in stone yet. That's just a suggestion and a point uh, that we probably go that way, but we still have to get a lot of approvals and so on from ANSI to get that to happen. Rigging hardware asked about interpretation for correct use of round length. There you go. And uh, let's look at 27 is uh, material placement. And that's these are pumper trucks. And they have, their, they have a place in ASME. Uh, they are moving material on site. Uh, this 09 is a great standard. And we have a new one coming out in 14. Uh, there's a lot of uh, things that have been upside down with this uh, pumper truck industry because the construction is down. I want to really caution folks to make sure that as you re-employ these and put these back onto projects, make sure that we've got training uh, for all the personnel, the poor superintendent, the operator, uh, all the, the placement supervisor, all of those folks. Uh, we're, these things, if we're not working them properly, can really hurt a lot of folks. Uh, you get a lot of weight up in the air. Stability is, can be an issue if we don't set them on foundation, so, solid foundation. So these are going to be coming back into the workplace in a stronger way as our economy picks up. And, and we really want to make sure we're taking care and attending to uh, having good machines work in a good area. Material placement uh, systems are called to provide immediate consultation. That looks like a bridge I probably wouldn't want to be running on. Uh, let's take a look at load balancing. And this is a brand new document, uh, 2011. These are the uh, air, basically the air systems uh, for uh, load handling on tabletops and light duty uh, items, sometimes packaging handling and small parts handling, sometimes anywhere from uh, you know a quarter ton to five to uh, a half ton up to maybe uh, three to five ton. Pretty small items, but uh, they do uh, did were able to get them included in this last go around in 2011. And uh, air hydraulic counterweighted systems and so on. Next revision is 2015. If you have load balancers or balance lifting units in your facility, you'd certainly want to get your hands on that. Uh, next one in line here, and it will be. Uh, we think it's going to be this year. I'm going to actually kind of put a 2013 date on this for self-erecting tower cranes. And so we think that's our best target date right now. Huge in Europe, getting bigger in the States. And uh, it's a brand new standard. Um, Dave uh, Ritchie uh, from uh, Texas is the chair for this. And he's got a really uh, strong uh, group of folks behind him that's helped put this together. And the main committee, I think, has done most of the voting on this. Um, but we still need to go up for public review and ANSI approval. And there may be a few more items that they have to clean up before it can actually be released for publication. So it will be design, construction, inspection, and operation. Those are always the four big uh, chapter sections for pieces of machinery. So if you open almost any V30 volume machinery-wise, those are going to be the four elements. And they've done a super job getting that ready for us. And I'm sure you're looking forward to getting it released very soon. Um, Self-wrecking tire cranes sometimes pray for progress and speed. Sometimes they don't. Well, those porta potties going through that bridge, well, you get the picture. OK, so let's take a look. The brand new one here under development also, and this may be a few years down the road. It may be 2014 or so. It's called uh, ropes. And that will likely be the official title, ropes. B30.30, this is under development. And it will include wire rope and synthetic rope. And I want you to kind of take this in with me. This is a whole, uh, it's sort of like, I think the easiest thing you want to think about this is it's sort of like hooks work on all kinds of equipment, right? So hooks work on slings, on chain falls, on chain hoists, on come-alongs, on cranes, on tire cranes, on mobile cranes. And, and so hooks are spread and referred to all through a lot of the ASME B30 documents. Well, that's really how we're going to be pressing for B3030 for ropes, that it will be uh, taking uh, a place because let me take you to the next frame as a, a maybe a better explanation. Right now what happens, if you can see this, if we make one change in wire rope on inspection or care maintenance uh, criteria, to get through about 15 or 18 volumes that all have rope in them, it may take up to nine years to get this one change that happens in 2012 
to get down here to the last volume by the time we get revisions and updates. So a number of the chairmen came to us and asked if we would create a new B30.30 called ROPES and extract it. Basically what you're going to see is um, it will be uh, within a volume, uh, let's say of 0.5, we'll call this 0.5 mobile crane. When you go to the ROPES section, you'll see ROPES. Uh, replacement of ropes, etc. All a lot of that information will be, say, C B thirty point thirty, and it'll have it'll detail with inspections, uh, maintenance, care, use, um, maybe some criteria information, and so on. So it's going to be actually taken out and moved into B thirty point thirty, just sort of like hooks are uh, referred to B thirty point ten for hook information. So it may uh, likely include we have some winches uh, and other equipment that use synthetic ropes. So you'll see synthetic rope as an optional type of hoisting medium uh, to be used. So synthetic ropes are used in winches and other applications. They're already used for digger derricks. And uh, some are considered uh, being used for crane. And we'll see how that market takes into that. So this is a whole uh, new element that's going to take place, and we're starting to see some. There's probably uh, uh, 14 people on that. Uh, Dave Henninger with um, uh, Bryden Wire Rope is the chair for that, and there's about uh, 12 or 14 of us that are serving on that subcommittee. But that'll be a few years before we get all that done. When we do, it will be extracted from the other volumes. That's the game plan at the moment. So be looking for that as it gets developed. Um, I did promise you a P30, a little update and review. And P30, as you know, I'm the chairman for that, and I have the honor of serving with about 20 uh, other folks on the main committee and another 10 folks that are contributing members. And I'll tell you what, we have an awesome team put together, and uh, Kate Hyam is our, B30, our P30 secretary. She's she really is sort of the glue that holds it all together and does a super job. Uh, we are just really at the first uh, major balloting of these items. And so I can't release those documents to you because uh, through an ASME agreement, members of committees can't just simply send out work uh, product that's in progress um, because it all has to go through voting, through main committee voting, through ANSI approval, public review, and so on. So we're really in in the throws, but I will say to you, we're going to do a first ballot uh, in uh, this next month, well actually in this month, in September, and we will try to resolve those issues in October of 12, and then we go through recirculation November, and, uh, and potentially finish balloting out January, February, and I would really hope that we could have some things ready for ANSI review by February, March of 2013. I, we are really close. I'll tell you, we're really getting down to grammatical and editing small things, and it's really, um, we've made a super uh, headway on it. You'll notice in, uh, I've done a, P, uh, a lift planning, lift considerations webinar here a few months ago, and many of the items that get into the classifications considerations, if you'd like to go back and visit that, you'll probably find a lot of similarities. So if you want to catch up on what Chapter 1 might look like, that would probably be a good place to do it, just a hint. And then critical lifts and what might be involved with critical lifts and on how to execute the critical lift. There are 10 items that should be considered uh, in the critical lift formulation process, and that will get down to um, the load, the rigging, the LHE. You remember that from our previous uh, webinars, LHE, Load Handling Equipment? Uh, so it, there are 10, 10 basic steps we've identified so far. It'll be about the people, the execution, the uh, pre-lift meeting, the, uh, the lift itself, and then the post-lift meeting. And, uh, there's, it's, and we'll, we are uh, currently considering samples of lift plans to put into the appendix. So it's, uh, it's really going to have a, a marvelous impact. And I know we've got a couple of questions from folks that have written in about lift director and things like that, which I'll address in just a few minutes. Um, but let's see where we are here. Okay, quiz time. Hope everybody's uh, hanging in there with me. All right, now, Christina has forwarded to you a link 
or you've already downloaded a form that looks a little bit like this on the right of your screen. It's a PDF document. You can actually type into it, or you can print it and, type and write into it. And I have four different uh, pictures to put up in front of you. So you'll see one, two, three, four, and then there's a series of blanks that go with each one of those. And you'll notice off to the left is a full listing of all the B30 equipment. So please get your uh, PDF document ready to take this quiz. And uh, I'm going to start putting up a picture here in just a minute. Now please take a look. And what I want you to do is to write in the B30 equipment that you see in the picture on section one of that form. And you, your option listing, obviously, is over here. And whether it's existing, here's the thing, it's existing or uh, under development. All right? Christina, you are we still on and good here, huh? We're good to go. OK, here we go. So we've got um, look at the picture really close. Let me see if I can amplify the picture for you. This is in a building. And let me amplify this for you here a little bit and move this around. Take a look at the picture there. You'll see a variety of uh, components. And so how many, how many ASME volumes do you see represented by the load handling in this photo? So some of you probably see the hoisting equipment. And don't forget, existing documents or under development. So it could be a new document that I've listed off. And it's on your, your sheet that you printed out for you. So let's see. I think, you know, actually there's, I'm going to give you a hint, there's more than, more than four, and, but not as many as uh, nine. Let's do that. So, so let's see how close you get. I'm going to give you a few, four, few more minutes to take a hard look. And I'm going to sweep this picture sideways. So let's see the, um, what equipment, what B30 equipment, like do you see, um, uh, let's see, do you see a spreader bar in there? That would be B30.20. If yes, fine. If no, no. Um, what other kinds of equipment? do you happen to see in there? And I'm not going to try to lead you on here. I'm just going to try to give you a tip here. So I'm going to give you a different view for just a minute. Take a look. And we're going to time this out in just a minute. So make your list. Be writing your list down. And Christina, let me know if we break communication. I'm getting some uh, indicators in my ear here. So if I go offline, I'll get the phone dialed back up. All right. Okay, so we're going to switch to the next photo. Everybody with me here? So let's go to question quiz number two. Get a reduced view of that for just a minute. All right, here's quiz number two right here. So take a look. What equipment, B3 equipment volumes, do you see represented? Like, do you see B30 point? One, do you see uh, like uh, a, a, a telescopic hydraulic gantry system? I don't see any there. Do you see a um, large mounted crane? No, it's on ground here. So what do we see for uh, the crane type or hoisting equipment and other associated equipment? Let me spring this up. And Christine, everything good for our volume and sound? I'll ramp this. OK. I'll ramp this up a little bit. I will tell you that this is a load indicating device. That's a little hard to see in the picture. So there's a little silver box right up there. And it's got some, heart, some hardware above and below it. That's an LID. And so I'd kind of give you that one. Which volume does that come from? Do you remember? So make your listing. So you're going to need to list down which one's B30 point X, Y, Z. Which ones do you see in this listing? 
So take a hard look. We're going to get ready to move forward here. So take a hard look. And so you know you've got the load handling equipment. You know what that type is. And what other items do you see? And uh, make your list quick. And how are you doing on that? So let's go to the next one. Everybody with me? All right. We're going to go to our next uh, quiz here. Let's take a look at the next. Okay, quiz number three. So let's take a look. And we have probably about four to seven different low volumes, B30 point volumes in this. And somewhere in there. Now I'm going to help try to uh, amplify the picture for you. And I'm going to let you know. Let me go up to 150 here. All right, so we have, notice there's a load down here. And it has some uh, equipment around it. And those pieces of equipment go right into another set of legs or equipment. And those all go up into that orange ball holding pieces of equipment. And that's all supported by a big LHE, which is a load handling equipment machine. So let's, we should have our good list there. So let's see what you got. All right. I'm getting ready to go to quiz four. So let's do that. And quiz four. How many ASME volumes do you see represented by load handling in this photograph? So let's take a look here. I'll just leave it uh, open for a minute. So you'll see this is inside of a building. You'll see a runway up here. And that runway is supporting the LHE that's up above it. And you'll notice uh, you'll start to see a part of that LHE equipment right up here at the top. And then there are devices hanging below that, there and here, and devices here, and devices there, and items there. All right, so let's see how many do you find listed for quiz four, for picture four. And I will amplify that just for a moment, and then we'll move into our answer session. So I'll pull this more into play here. Can you see everything a little closer and tighter there? Okay. Everybody working along, and I'll scroll this up. OK, so we're good there. All right, excellent. OK, so let's see how we're going to get this done. Let me go to the next frame here. OK, what I'm going to ask you to do is uh, quiz scoring. Boy Scouts honor, on my honor. So I'm going to, this is the honor program and equivalent to the Boy Scouts. So be trustworthy. That's the first point of the Scout law, be trustworthy. All pencils are down. And if you're doing it on your computer, no more computer entry. And if you're ready, we can do the scoring now or you'll, you'll understand. And what you'll do is you'll email in your results to Carol at ITI. But I'll give you that at the very end here. So let's take a look. At the first one, quiz one, do you remember that load going through that uh, powerhouse? And here's the answers for quiz one, just to see how you did. And so we have uh, seven. We have overhead crane, point two, point ten for hooks, point thirty for ropes. Don't forget that's under development, right? Everybody with me? Uh, point nine for slings. We have point twenty six for shackles and hardware. We have a hand chain hoist right here. And I'm sorry, we have a hand chain hoist right here, the orange one. And then we have a lever hoist over here on the left side. So we have come alongs and manual hoist, shackles and turnbuckles. We have slings. We have the rope for the crane, which is the new under development, and hooks. And we have the overhead crane. So we should have these seven by call out for quiz one. All right. Hope you did good. Let's keep going forward. So for quiz two, that was the mobile crane out in the yard. So let's get our answers up. And the answers, there are six items that we've identified 
in quiz two. We have five for a mobile crane, point ten for a hook. You see the hook right up here. We have 30 for the rope supporting the system because there's a headache ball uh, on up above. There is a point twenty-six for rigging hardware. We have shackles all over the place in this guy. And we have the dynamometer right there, the LID is under 26. We have a hand chain hoist right here. And of course, we have slings throughout. So we have six items. You should have these particular six items listed on your um, solution for quiz two. Let's go to quiz three. That is the tower crane. That was in New York City. I was on the project of 4th of July. This is at uh, across from Carnegie Hall. This is the 77-story building. And uh, so let's take a look at the answers for this. And there are five of them. Item uh, First item is, or, or out of sequence, doesn't have to be in proper sequence, but point three for tower cranes, point ten for hooks. The hooks are always at the end of the device. Point thirty for the rope. And that is under development. And I told you it would be existing or under development. Point nine for the slings. These are all sling assemblies. And the uh, rigging hardware that we have um, incorporated into the, into the system. And we have master links right up here that are uh, rigging hardware. OK, so we have five items for that. And let's take a look at quiz four. Remember, that's the indoor overhead crane with a lifting beam. And let's see how many items we have for that. And I hope that you have, let's get that back into view here. Sorry about that. And I hope you have point two for hook, or point two for overhead cranes, point 10 for hooks, point 30 for the rope, point nine for slings. We have uh, rigging hardware. There's swivel hoist strings right there and shackles, of course. And finally, we got in one of those below the hook lifting devices, point 20 for the spreader bar, or lifting beam. So we're good to go there. So we should have six items there on that particular quiz. And what we'd like to do is to go, here's your scoring uh, outline here is if you got 23 or 24 out of 24, uh, you're good for a $50 gift certificate if your company allows that. And if you got 19 to 22 correct, you have $25 gift certificate. 13 to 18, and 1 to 12. So carol at iti.com is your key contact for your gift certificate at the bookstore. OK, let's take a look at, uh, we do have two questions. And I would like to entertain those. And uh, Christina may be uh, working on different questions at the moment. There's a question right now is, what is uh, by um, Nate Dickinson with Crane Industry Services? and um, the question is, uh, how do you see OSHA involving the P30 uh, in the, um, it's basically OSHA and P30 uh, involved in the uh, activities. And I do see it because uh, in P30 leans heavily on the, on the uh, operations of the lift director and a lot of decisions that person makes. You'll notice in this new OSHA requirement, um, 1419, for a lift director where there is one on signal systems for hand signals, voice communications, additional requirements. You'll notice we've got lift director highlighted there. And the operator, signal person, and lift director, if there is one, must be able to effectively communicate in the language used. But also in the, um, in the new construction uh, code 1926-1432 for multiple crane lifts. And OSHA is calling, basically they're calling um, for a lift director it's a person that's a competent person, qualified person, or a competent person to, who is assisted by one or more qualified persons. And they put in parentheses, lift director. And it says that the lift director must review the plan in a meeting with all workers. So they've actually called out lift director. Once you tie that lift director in, you'll easily tie in P30 as a industry accepted consensus document. And I would tell you that it's going to be in a few years that um, the uh, OSHA is going to be uh, you know, continue to lean heavily on the ASME documents, which are the, uh, such as the B30.5, which they already lean heavily on, and the P30 for lift planning, it's all going to be tied in so that when OSHA says, listen, there is an industry standard for lift planning, you've dropped this load, uh, P30 is an excellent document for lift planning, why were you not using it? 
And so I got to tell you, next five to eight years, we're going to see a huge marriage, I think, at least as the OSHA folks get educated about the value of P30 and where it's going. I think you'll see it uh, more commonly referred to in a lot of the issues and accidents that are taking place in response to, to those items. Uh, let me uh, address this one particular. Aaron Gro uh, uh, Grossing uh, from Excel Energy. Uh, Grossinger is the intent of the lift director uh, to, to be uh, uh, a, basically I'm going to call it a standalone person, or can he uh, wear multiple hats? And I'm paraphrasing your question, Aaron, and I'm sorry for that, but I want to kind of get that uh, idea here is that your question is, is the intent of a lift director to be an independent rigger or for oversight only? So can he do more than one thing? And notice that these are the five uh, selection areas or assignments and role areas that we currently commonly know about. And I'm going to take you over here just for a second to see the different uh, setups that uh, folks can, can uh, a lift director may be involved he may be working for the uh, site supervisor, certainly, and the, and the corporation which owns the crane, manages the crane operator and all of that, so he may be directly involved here. The lift director can uh, actually, he can uh, rig the load. Uh, he can signal the crane. He can serve as a signal person. Uh, and um, he could be the crane user uh, all, all, all at the same time. That, so he can wear multiple hats, or he can delegate and designate riggers, signal persons, and others that work with him or for him. So the lift director is a person, he can, the answer is yes, he can, he can wear multiple hats. It does not have to be uh, a standalone oversight only type uh, position uh, for that individual. He can, he can do multiple things. I would really encourage you to not have the lift director not also be the crane operator. I think you really run into problems, and that's a Mike Parnell thing, it's not anything else, but I think you really run into problems when you don't have a person out on the ground watching what's happening with the load, the rigging, the, the site, the control, and the, all those other things in personnel, and be in the cab at the same time. So I just think at that point you probably got to break that in two and have at least an operator in the cab and somebody on the ground and he can actually be serving in multiple roles. Okay, great. Hey, I hope everybody did uh, good on their uh, quiz and I'd like to see those sent in to Carol at ITI. Uh, Christina, I need to ask you, are there any other questions that I can help answer? People have really done a great job. Oh, by the way, here's our little uh, outline. Uh, this should be your answer key for that quiz. So you can double check your work here, item one. Check those items out, longhand, item one, two, nine, 10, 16, 21, 26, and 30. Quiz two is five, nine, 10, 16, 26, and 30. Question three is point three, nine, 10, 26, and 30, and question four is point two, nine, ten, twenty, twenty-six, and thirty. All right. Uh, Christina, do we have other questions that anybody has for us? Anything I can help with? I do have a couple questions for you, Mike. Okay. Jim, uh, the first one is from Jim Lomsky uh, with Shara Lifting. And uh -huh. he's asking, do you foresee the training requirements that are specified in B30.2, i.e. the written and practical exams with certification or formal records, being adopted into B30.11, point point .16, and point .17 in the future? I do. I do believe that uh, uh, I do uh, expect uh, the training requirements that will uh, to be carried over from the overhead crane group into the overhead hoist uh, ac activity area, and that would be point uh, uh, currently point 0.11, point 0.16, point, uh, 0.17, and point 0.21. I do believe that, that the training will be there. What I don't know is um, testing and verification. But I do believe that all of the uh, volumes will end up with a training 
uh, requirement in them for all the machinery type uh, ASME equipment, how far they will go with the testing, verbal or, or written, or by verification, practical or not, that will, that will be yet to be seen. But I do believe the training requirements will be there. Great question, Jim. Thank you for that. Uh, any other questions? Just one more, Mike. Nathan Dickinson with Crane Industry Services had one more. Um, looking back yep. at B30.2, for overhead cranes, does the railway need to be labeled for capacity? Uh, excellent question. Does the runway uh, need to be labeled uh, for capacity? And not to my knowledge, and uh, it is an engineered runway. Uh, and I don't, I don't ever receive, uh, ever remember seeing that um, because it is an engineering function. Much like, would you not, you not label the ground on which a crane sits on? So the runway is pre-engineered and engineered designed for the bridge on which it uh, that sits on it, or the multiple bridges that sit on it. So this is the B thirty point two question. Excellent question. But to my knowledge, Nathan. Um, this is my answer is that the runway does not need to be labeled, even though you can have multiple bridges running on the same runway system. The engineering for the runway and the columns and ground foundation support um, is, uh, is simply that. And they have to engineer it for worst case, highest load uh, conditions. And um, it's the hoisting machinery. It's, it's the crane that does the lifting. And that is, um, that is what needs to be um, um, qualified, verified, et cetera, by load testing and so on. And that is traceable and trackable and has a B30 volume to attend to it. But the supporting structure, uh, I have yet to see where it has to physically be labeled. I don't think that's true. Uh, if, if, if you find that in the new volume of B30.2, I'd sure love to see it. But at the moment, uh, I don't I don't recall any labeling requirements for runways and columns. Thank you for the question. OK, excellent, excellent. Christine, anything else? That's it, Mike. OK, fantastic. Well, listen, we've had a great time with everybody today. And uh, I was through the uh, little town of Gravity, Iowa. And uh, when it uh, says gravity goes, we all go. And I certainly agree with that. I went to the. Uh, the little city park in Gravity, Iowa, and was able to go to the center of gravity just on a vacation. So I hope all of you get to go to the center of gravity someday. They'd love for you to uh, show up and uh, have a little gander through the town. It's a very nice people, and it's a lovely site. So let's take a look, uh, and we'll be working with you on the next uh, webinar in October. And I sure look forward to seeing you. And thank you so much for attending with us today. And uh, if you have any questions or anything I can help you with, Immediately, uh, it's a Mike at iti.com. And Christina, thanks so much for your help today. And I look forward to uh, visiting with all our friends in the industry as time goes along here. Everybody have a great weekend. And take care. And we'll be talking to you soon. We're going to sign off now. And uh, see you later. Bye-bye.